Hi. Hi. This is Port Williams United Baptist Church. We're here for worship this morning. This is, this is our sanctuary. Uh, I know you haven't been here. We haven't been in here for a long, long time, so welcome. You do not know how wonderful it is to be here and see people. It is just absolutely fabulous. I hope you feel the same way. Um, wave to people around if you have not had a chance to greet each other. And then please be seated. It really is good seeing you today. It's good having you who are joining us via the internet, uh, joining with us as well. Welcome to this time of worship. Um, this is one of those transition times. Lana was just telling me as I walked in, she said, Don, it's summer, you don't have to wear your robe. And I'm like, no, technically summer doesn't start until this week when school is out. <clears throat> but I also wanted to wear this one more time next Sunday. Um, I'll be a little bit more casual. It'll be a little bit warmer in here, so dress appropriately. Uh, we do hope that you will join us then. Uh, today, following worship at 11.30 time shift, we will be having Sermon Talk Back on Zoom. The details are on our website. Um, and so we hope that you will join us. It'll give you a chance to get home, or if you're at home, grab another cup of coffee and join us at 11.30 a time for us to have some conversation about the worship service, about the sermon, uh, to dialogue, just another chance for us to be together. This Thursday is Canada Day, and as such, we will not be having coffee and conversation. Uh, this past week, as we gathered, we decided that we will take a break for July and then see how things are in August, September, in hopes that instead of be meeting virtually, we might actually be able to gather in Lockwood Hall. Um, so um, stay tuned for that. We are glad that you are here this morning, a time for us to be not only with each other, but even more so with God. So let us take a few moments to prepare our hearts and minds to greet our God. Thank you. Please join us in the call to worship. We come in joy to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space where countless people have known God's presence. We give thanks for the sense of awe and reverence we experience 
as we have come together to share in our praise of God. We come in expectation to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space, where we can experience God's shalom. We give thanks for the freedom and peace we experience as we have come together to share in our praise of God. We come in trust to celebrate and worship God in this sacred space because here we are challenged to faithfulness. We give thanks for the God who understands and loves us and who hears our fears, our tears, and our songs of praise. We joyfully come together to share in our praise of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 to 47. Oh, came the people, everyone, be, everyone because many wonders of, and signs were, be, begin, were, begin, were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the time that I have been looking forward to because as I have mentioned, one of the hardest parts about being virtual about recording the services is that this part of the service has not, it's been, I've been talking to children that I have not been able to see. So, Abby, it's good to see you. Liam, it's good to see you, and thank you for reading that. You know, I've been thinking, because we've been talking about prayer recently. Have you ever been in prayer and thought, who am I talking to? That's the way I felt many times during this virtual time. You know, I'll come in here, and I'll record the service, and it just goes up into the internet. And I wonder, will anybody see it? Will anybody hear it? Who am I talking to? Sometimes that's the way prayer is. We say our prayers and we wonder, is anybody listening? Have you ever had that thought? I have. There have been times where even in church when I've been in prayer, there's been this thought in the back of my head like, who are you talking to? Is anybody listening? Prayer is an act of faith. We pray believing that God is listening. Hoping and trusting that God is listening to what we are saying. And because God has said, I am with you. I am as near to you as your breath I am right there with you. And we just have to take that on faith. Just like I have to believe that on Sunday mornings when we've been worshiping online virtually, that somebody, that somebody was out there listening. Because there are those times. There are those times when we have come together and I see you. You get to see each other. Where we experience the present presence of God that make it all real. There are going to be those times in which you feel God so real in your life that you feel like you could just reach out and touch God. Hold on to those times because those are the times when you know, you know God's listening. Let's pray. God, in those times in which we feel you are so far away or not even there, Help us to continue to pray, because in doing so, we live out our hope. We live out our assurance that you are with us, that you care for us, and that you are always with us. Help us to feel you even this day. 
Amen. This is a bit of a last minute change, but it's uh, Matthew chapter 6, not chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 13. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corner, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received this their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases at the Gentiles do, as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive, of we, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Let us pray together. Numbers, God. Once we get out of math class, many of us just put them aside. Numbers are relegated to the price of an item, speed limits, weights on a scale. At church, we think of them when it comes time for budgets and measuring attendance and growth. We confess that many times we just want to put them out of our minds. We even seem to avoid that book in the Bible that goes by that name. But numbers, God, have suddenly come to the front of our minds in ways that we would not choose. Eleven new COVID cases in our province yesterday. Thirteen stories collapsing in a Miami apartment building. 159 individuals who are missing, 215 unmarked graves, 751 unmarked graves. God, those numbers terrify us. They confound us, they convict us. We really don't know where to turn. What do we do in the face of an invisible virus? How do we feel safe when buildings just collapse? What do we do when our corporate sin is revealed? God, there are no words. Even as we rejoice that our number of COVID cases is falling, that we are back together, we do realize that there are empty chairs around tables this day. There are those who do who still do not feel comfortable coming back to worship, who are leery of being around others. And so, God, we pray for all of those who this day are dealing with that fear, with the loneliness that comes in the wake of this virus. And God, we do pray for our indigenous neighbors who this week have been reminded again of the horror that we have inflicted upon them, that we continue to inflict upon them. We are all victims of the sins of our fathers and forefathers, results which have been passed down from generation to generation. God, forgive us and help us find tangible ways to work towards reconciliation with you and with each other. For God, that is what Jesus taught us with his life. It's what he taught us to pray for when he said, when you pray, Pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. I hope you've been with us over these past few weeks if we, as we've been looking at prayer, one of the basic parts of a faith that is growing. It has been a conversation, much more a conversation than an edict from on high. As I've said, I do not pretend to be an expert on prayer in no way, shape, or form. I'm more like a pilgrim on this journey with you. What I've attempted to do in this series is to share some things with you that I've gathered along the way, understanding that I have a long, long way yet to go. We started several weeks ago talking about just what prayer is. The short version is that prayer is the way that we have a conversation with God, not a monologue, not just us doing all the talking, but a conversation with both parties talking, us and God, which means that we have to do some listening too and also calls into question our theology, our idea, our understanding about who God is. Who is this entity that we are having a conversation with, that we're talking to? Is God a harsh taskmaster always looking for us to beg and grovel for the very things of life? 
Is God always looking for a way, a reason to punish us for anything that we might do wrong? Or is God love always looking to do everything that God can do to bring good to us and to our world? Those are very different images, and they do and they will affect the way in which we pray or don't pray. And we've looked at some of the reasons, other reasons that we might not pray. Our image of God being one of them, our idea of what prayer is and does or doesn't do. But if we're honest, my guess is that most of the time we don't pray because we don't have the time or we just don't take the time. There's so many things demanding our time and our attention that too often we don't take those moments to center our lives, to connect with the ground of our being. And then we wonder, we wonder why we feel so disjointed, so rushed, so not me, not ourselves. Could it be that we're really not doing the things that really are the most important? Another reason so we learned is that we really don't know how to pray. We are like the disciples in Luke's gospel who come to Jesus and say, Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is not something that we get just as we come out of the baptismal waters. It is something that we have to learn. And my guess is that most of us know some prayers. We have been taught some prayers that we know just by rote. God is great and God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. We know that one, right? How many of us say that even now? Even now before a meal. And how many of us learned that bedtime prayer? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray, dear Lord, my soul to take. Okay, we're not going to talk about the terror of that prayer or even the theology, but we learned it, didn't we? We were taught that prayer. We were taught how to pray. My guess is that we know pretty much by memory the Lord's Prayer, the one that we said in worship today. Our Father who art in heaven. And we know that prayer. We may ask whether this church is a trespasser or a debtor kind of church. But we know the prayer. We know it. And because we know these prayers, we often think that, well, they don't count. And they're not real prayers. Wrote prayers, memorized prayers aren't as good as real prayers. Father James Martin reminds us, though, that memorized prayers are, are important. They connect us with believers through time and through history. The Lord's Prayer is one that has been offered throughout centuries. I have prayed it in Bali, in Prague, in Rome, in London, in Charleston, in Port Williams. It's one of the ways in which we share the communal aspect of worship with people around the world and across time. And many times, prayers of others, rote prayers, express our feelings better than we can put into words because they are so familiar. And other times, though, they, they really can be a great challenge. Do you hear it as we said it this morning? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Really? Forgive us our trespasses in the same way as we forgive others. Do we really want that to happen? Is that what we are praying for? See, there are times when our memorized prayers can push us to examine our theology, to examine ourselves. Another way to pray, though, is to pray the prayers of other people, to read them. 
Isn't that cheating, someone asked? Not at all, at least I hope not. In my office, I have several books of prayers that I turn to very often. One is a gift from a dear friend. He gave me, just before we left Charleston, he came and gave me an autographed copy of Walter Rauschenbusch's Prayers for the Social Awakening. It was written in 1909. And the prayers in that, in that book are as current today as the day it was written. I have a guide to prayer for all God's people, a daily devotional that goes through the church year. I have Shane Claiborne's, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove's, and Enuma Akora's Litany for Ordinary Radicals, another devotional full of prayers that help me. And all of these, all of these help widen my view of the world and many times allow me to pray in ways that I don't even know I need to pray. There are also times in which a prayer by someone else really does say what I am feeling, what I want to say far better than any words that I might have. Thomas Merton gave us one of those in his Thoughts in Solitude prayer which is universal in its appeal and expresses our deep yearning for our following. Merton wrote, My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me, and I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself, and the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I'm actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. See, I just don't think I could ever improve on that. There are other ways in which we might pray. In this new world in which we stay in touch with family and friends via the internet, through wonderful apps that help us stay in touch with God, there are those apps that do, it, do that for us. There are some apps that I use regularly. One is a daily podcast, Pray As You Go. It's a daily prayer session produced by Jesuit Media Initiatives in Britain. It's, it's designated to be heard, as the name suggests, as you go. Ranging from 10 to 13 minutes is a great resource to use on your commute or while fixing breakfast. Just another way in which we are called and allowed to pause for prayer. Last summer, as we were meeting virtually, Davida introduced us to Lectio Divina, a way of praying the scriptures, of seeing ourselves in the text and allowing the scriptures and God to speak to us through them. And there are some sites online that will allow you to do this, um, allowing you to pause and center your life I like them because it allows me to listen to someone else read the text. It allows me to get into hearing rather than reading. Because sometimes, sometimes just using another sense opens us up to ways in which our prayer life becomes real in ways that we could never have imagined. When Anita and I were in Bali, our friends Jonathan and Tina held a Sunday evening session called Art and Contemplation. Art and Contemplation. Two things that I will say do not fit me, but they are very much in Anita's wheelhouse. But we only had one scooter. And so every Sunday evening, I would take her and be there while they did their drawings, their meditations, their praying. I was basically just a spectator. 
or at least I thought. I got sucked into the practice. And recently I came upon a similar way of praying called Visio Divina, a lot like Lectio Divina, except this is visual, a practice where you still yourself and you meditate on a picture, allowing it to speak to you to see where you might discover God. It's another way in which we can pray using another sense rather than speech. It allows us to listen, to see what God might have to say to us. All of these, all of these methods require us to stop, to set aside some time, to center our lives. And we need that, don't we? We need that. But many times in the middle of the day, we don't have the luxury of just stopping, of just being. So what then? What then? How, how can we pray without ceasing? How can we keep our lives centered on God? About 15 years ago, we had the opportunity to be a part of a program that radically changed my spiritual life. Companions in Christ is a 28-week program that invites us to look seriously at our spiritual lives. I will confess that that 28 weeks initially scared me off. As I told people, I've had relationships that didn't last 28 weeks. But our church, our church was going to be one of the pilot programs. My wife was going to be the leader of one of the groups. And I was the pastor. I didn't see any way that I could get out of it. And as I said, it revolutionized my faith especially the six weeks we spent on prayer. One thing I especially remember is breath prayer. I had never heard of it before. It's intended to be short, six to eight syllables. That's all. Six to eight syllables that can be said in one breath. With your eyes closed, you imagine... God calling you by name. Imagine that God is actually saying, Don, what do you want? And then we respond. Like the blind man on the road to Jer Jericho, Jesus looks at us and looks us in the eyes and says, What do you want? How would you answer? Give God a simple and direct answer that comes honestly from your soul, from your heart, and write it down. If you have more than one answer, write those down too. Your answer may be just one word like love or help. It may be several words like to feel your presence. Whatever your answer is, that becomes the foundation of your breath prayer. Select the name of God that you feel most comfortable with. Combine it with your written answer to the question God answered you, and that's your prayer. A breath prayer, in a breath prayer, you just breathe in the first phrase. Usually it's your invocation, your, your calling of God's name. And then bring out, breathe out the phrase, your request, or your need. Some examples might be, Jesus, let me feel your love. O oh Lord, show me your way. Father, Mother, let me feel your presence. We were doing this at a difficult time. We were heading into Advent. And the one thing I was not feeling was great joy. And so my prayer during that session was, Oh God, let me feel your joy. I found myself praying it several times every day. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. Until in worship, on the third Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of joy, I was overwhelmed. I invite you to try it. Practice it several times a day. As you're washing dishes, driving in your car, sitting at your desk, wherever you happen to be when you just feel you want to be in the presence of God, whenever you want to be reminded that you are a child of God. 
It's a way to pray. It is a way to pray. There's not a singular way. There's not the way. There, the answers to how to pray are as numerous as there are people. And the, very, and the answers are as varied as a menu at a restaurant. I don't eat the same thing for every meal. And I don't pray the same way all the time. My faith needs the variety. And there are times when I go back to those three basic prayers that Anne Lamott identified. Help, thanks, wow. There are times when those three words say everything we need to say, right? There are times when we need to pray, God, help. God, thanks. God, wow. Wow. Other times when the only prayer I can offer and the only one I need to offer is, oh God. Oh God. And that's enough. That is enough. How do we pray? How do we do this thing? Oh, there are so many different ways. In the end, however, it is our deciding that we will connect ourselves with the ground of our being, with our God. And if we do this, then prayer I'll just remember the old ad. Just do it. Just do it. Just pray. Amen. Thank you for being here. So just smile for a second. Because, see, I'm realizing that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to be looking back and saying, what happened during that time? What happened? And somebody's going to find, out, find a picture of the Sunday in which Port Williams United Baptist Church ever got back to come back together for the second time. So smile real big, please. Yeah, smile, because you've got your mask on. So it, it, it's great. You know, we can see your smiling faces that way. You too, Christiane. You're in the picture too. Thank you. Oh, that's good. We are glad that you were here. Hope that you will rush home. Not really rush home, that you will spend some time speaking to each other. But in about an hour, uh, at 1130 Atlantic Daylight Time, we are going to be gathering on Zoom to have a conversation. We invite you to join us. If you are joining us at home, grab another cup of coffee and be with, you, be with us. Mike, Alana, Abby, thank you for helping us enter into prayer and to being with God today. It was so meaningful. Liam, Aaron, thank you for your assistance, and thank you.
We have come to worship, to offer our prayers, to our very being to God. God sends us out to be the people of God. So as we go, may we hear our benediction. You are the people of God. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that our world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So go now, and as you go, may the Lord take your hands and work through them. May the Lord take your lips and speak through them. May the Lord take your hearts and set them on fire, both now and forevermore. I know that last week we honored our graduates, but we have one of them.